going to lay hands on some of you tonight. Uh, Dr. Frank Bayo, uh, he brought his books tonight. I asked him to set up a table. He's got a lot of resources here, and usually he can tell us whatever he's teaching, what book it's in. Come on down. Dr. Frank, Frank Bayo, one of our elders here in the church. Thank you, Pastor. Got the word. Come on, give the Lord a praise in the house. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. He's to be exalted above every name. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, computer, let's get with the program now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, there's, there was a strong anointing here during the time of worship. And sometimes I just sense in my spirit, we need to spend more time there. I, I'm sensing it right now. I, I want you to understand something. When you are in his presence, no problem, no problem is greater than who he is. Every problem that we have seems insignificant to who he is. Oh, John, do you have something just very soft? Just lift up your hands. You are in his presence here tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, right now, bathe us right now. Bathe us right now. Bathe us right now with your awesome presence. Father, we thank you for your sweet, sweet spirit and presence we sense right now. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for all that you have done and you are about to release into our lives. For we recognize that we are in the last days and you said, and I bring to your remembrance your word. You said in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Father, I believe that we are on the threshold of an explosive outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And you're preparing a people that will be hungering and thirsting after righteousness and to be your hand extended. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the leadership of the house, for the pastor and his wife. Father, I thank you for them. Father, I thank you for each believer that is here. We're coming in the prayer of agreement, which is a place of power. And we thank you for that right now. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation, knowledge of Christ. And we thank you, O Lord, for you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the I am and the Alpha and the Omega. And for that, we give you all honor and glory, power and praise. Give the Lord a praise in the house. The subject, the topic that we're doing is rebuilding the altar for revival. Now, we saw last week that in order for you to build, rebuild the altar, you can't rebuild the altar by using the old stones. 
So you've got to tear down that which is there that has come to uh, a disrepair. And now what we need to do is take it down to its bare bones and start all over again. And we talked about the various elements of what we need to do to the, the elements. And by the way, uh, I, I really feel that the, the Mount Carmel encounter was nothing more than the battle of the ages. I want you to hear me. A lot of times when you hear about Mount, Mount Carmel, everybody says Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And that is true. That's in the, in the sense realm. And Pastor Phil used the terminology on Sunday. It's the earth suit mentality. You're looking at Elijah and you're looking at the prophets of Baal. But if we take the scales off our eyes, there was another battle that took place that was even greater than what was seen there on Mount Carmel. It was a battle between God, Jehovah, and Baal himself. And I got news to you. Nobody has fought with God and has won. Amen. My God does not know what defeat is. It's not even in his vocabulary. That's why the Bible says you can do all things through Christ. Not in our ability. But I want you to understand that what we're talking about now is rebuilding the altar for revival. Yes, but the question is, what is an altar? Tonight, we're going to be talking about various types of altars and what we need to do. And when Pastor Phil was talking about stones, I want you to understand that where we're going to be leading up to over the next couple of weeks, we're going to start talking about spiritual warfare in its highest level. Why? Because the fact is, the Bible says that God has called us to be warriors and not wimps. Let's look at some of these. Reasons for repairing the altar of the Lord. In many places, the fire of revival or renewal has dimmed or has been greatly hindered by the encroachment of sin, and flesh and the devil. In other words, in many churches, the world has come in. I remember growing up that Pastor Phil, you see, people don't know, being Italian when I came to the United States, my parents didn't go to an English-speaking church. We went to an Italian Pentecostal church. And there was a stigma that was associated to anybody that was Pentecostal. Oh, yeah. We were known as holy rollers. <laughs> I think maybe we need to return to that stigma. <laughs> I believe that some of us, God needs to wipe us on the ground a couple of times, roll us over. Come on. The stigma was so bad that at, at Halloween, the kids on the block would open up the door on Wednesday night and throw eggs and all of the rotten stuff that they would. Tomatoes. I'm saying this because what has happened is we were concerned at that time. We were seeing the things of the world and we said we need to put up a guard so that the world don't come into our church. Now what has happened is the guard is not there anymore. What do I mean by that? I mean that when God is there, there's a standard that is lifted up. As sin and lethargy around abound in many places, God calls to his people, what? Repair my altar. The Holy Spirit is once again directing his people. And I believe that this is the theme of, that we're embracing for these 10 weeks for the conference. And Pastor Phil is talking, don't let the fire go out on the altar. But I want you to understand whether it's the fire on the altar or rebuilding the altar. I'm saying that the central theme throughout it is the person called the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is once again directing his people back to the altar so that he can pour out his love, power, renewal, and healings. You see, when the Holy Spirit shows up and shows out, every need is going to be met. 
as the Holy Spirit brings us to a place of surrender, both in our hearts and at the gathering places such as churches, glorious and powerful things will begin to happen in the church of God. Why? Because there's a law of agreement. One chases a thousand, two set ten thousand to flight. The place of agreement is the place of power. Why is it last Wednesday night and then on Sunday? Why is it that when we're Friday? Why is it that when we're praying for people, there's a prayer of agreement and God responds exceedingly and abundantly more than you and I could ever dare to think or ask? Some of the reasons to repair the altar of the Lord include what? The altar is a place of consecration. Hmm. You're going to get some words that maybe we haven't heard in a long time. Consecration, let's look at what it says. For those who are sincerely following Christ, there is power in fresh consecration. What is it? I come back up to the altar and I get my batteries recharged. Hmm. Many of you know I travel uh, the country extensively. And uh, I use this as our, the base for our ministry. But I have a church where I go to which I'm under a different, uh, another covering, if you will. And that's up in Douglasville, Georgia. So what happens is, Pastor, if I got to drive to St. Louis because I take my books where I go, I can't put them on a plane. So I go take the car and I stop off at Douglasville, Georgia, which is nine hours from here. And then what I do is I go to get my batteries recharged. Why? Because you can't give what you ain't got. The biggest problem is that we operate out of what we have. God says, I want you to pour out my spirit upon you so that it'll be to overflowing. And the fact is, you have most successful ministries are they operate out of their overflow and not what's in the inside. Because it becomes a rippling effect. But what happens is it's that consecration where you come and you spend time with God. Rededicating all, uh, I'm sorry, rededicating all our all to Christ will bring a fresh fire on the altar. Hmm. Look at your hands for a minute. Okay. When you take a look in the mirror, you're seeing a person there. That's your humanity. That's not your spirit. Your humanity is subject to all of the laws and the natural laws. Your spirit is not subject to that. Why? Because the moment you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that you're now seated with him in heavenly places. Hmm. See, God never talks to you to your mind. He speaks, God is a spirit, he speaks to your spirit. By the way, you don't have a spirit, you are a spirit. And when you accept Christ as your Savior, you're sitting with him in heavenly places. In other words, he has, doesn't have to yell down to earth, hey, Frank, I'm trying to get your attention. Because my God still speaks in a sweet, still voice. Come on. And when you are consecrated, you're in that mode, if you will. Your spirit man is now tapped in and is able to communicate uninterruptedly. In the Old Testament, the priests were reminded uh, as the theme which is of this conference, a fire, a fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. Do you know what Hanukkah is? It's called the Festival of Lights. But do you know why it came into existence? Because the, a fire, the, the a fire was about to go out in the temple. And a man by the name of Judas Maccabee said, I know where we can get oil, but it's going to take me seven days round trip. And so they prayed. And God kept the oil on that fire, and it kept going until Judas came back with the sacred oil. I want you to understand something. The oil will keep the fire going, but the oil is also representative of the Holy Spirit. The fire is the power behind it. Hmm. That's why they have the Festival of Lights, but it's not really about lights. 
It's about the miracle that took place. Too many times we get wrapped up in the occasions and we forget to realize what is behind that occasion. Come on. Let's not get, you know, at Christmas time, everybody gets all wrapped up in the festivity. But how, the fact is, we got to remember that there was a birth that was associated with that. And that birth that was Jesus did not come only to live, but he came to die. Consecration. Let this remind us of the importance of the fire of total consecration to Christ. Come what may. In other words, when you consecrate yourself, you're making a decision. I don't care what goes around. The whole place could fall apart. I am consecrated. I keep my eyes on him. The second is the altar is a place of confession and repentance. And by the way, I don't believe that we need to go to a man to repent. Because that man cannot forgive me of my sin. My sins were already forgiven when I accepted a person called Jesus Christ. I want you to understand something we got to keep in mind, that what is repentance, and we'll see this in just a moment. It says when there is sin in our hearts, even if it is unrecognized as such, it hides the face of the Father from us. Whoa. Hmm. See what it says in Isaiah 59 too, and it says, for your sin sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear as a matter of fact there's another verse that follows in the book of isaiah too it says that if i have any sin in my heart god will not hear my prayers come on so the fact is this and what i would do is when my children were growing up and we would pray with them at nighttime, they would we go through the prayers and we came to a point where i said now Pray after me, Father, I ask you to forgive me of all of the things that I did that I knew was wrong. Amen. And then, forgive me of the things that I did wrong that I didn't know about. Why? We don't want to keep anything separating us from the Lord. But through confession and turning from sin, that's repentance, the Holy Spirit cleanses us by applying what? the precious blood of Christ. Then the barriers are removed and God's promises. I will no longer hide my face from them for I will pour out my spirit on the house of Israel and I want you to understand something. When you confess and you are in a mode of repentance, that vertical relationship is unhindered. It will not, the enemy cannot do anything to stop it. This is a hard one because our flesh resists this. The altar is a place of surrender. Hmm. I remember years ago there was an Alcacessel co commercial and it was uh, a, a woman was saying to her son he needed to do this had to do, and do this and the young man would turn around and say, Mother, I'd rather do it myself. Hmm. See, that's, that's self. That's the self-centered person. As people come to the altar in surrender, lives are transformed. We, we, we're now putting an, a, 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 an emphasis of praying, and, and that, that is excellent. We've got Wednesdays, we've got Fridays, we've got people coming, coming and praying all the time. And it's important, it's very important. But I want you to understand something. When you come and you're making that commitment at that given point, there's going to be a transformation that takes place. I'm going to say this. You can never get into God's presence without a change taking place. And the Bible assures us that where any two or three are gathered together, there I am in their midst. And folks, please, especially when we come into church, I want you to understand something. This whole thing is, uh, come Holy Spirit, I got news for you. The whole, you walk in, you're the temple of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's already there. Now, you want to welcome him, I got no problem with that. Welcome, Holy Spirit. See, the thing is this. The Bible says when any two or three are gathered together, he's already there in the midst. You don't have to invite him to come in. What he's saying is just recognize I'm here. And when you recognize he's there, then that gives him license to operate on your behalf and mine. But it requires the surrendering to the Lordship and to the power of the Holy Spirit. 
The altar is a powerful place for evangelism. As people are called to come forward to the altar to receive Christ as Lord. We've got many churches have gotten away from that. Here's what the scripture says. If you are ashamed of me before man, I'm going to be ashamed of you before the Father. Two great evangelists. Two great evangelists. Billy Graham and Charles Finney. Billy Graham, no doubt, has been the most successful evangelist in history. Why? Because he had the media and had the opportunity of being able to go around the world and be able to present the gospel and then give the invitation. I have a personal friend of mine that was one of the staff leaders with many of their crusades out on the West Coast. And I said to him, I said, tell me something. Were those crusades successful? He says they were successful when the people came forth, but then they fell apart after they left. Hmm. George Gallup is a pollster, and he said this. We did a survey making a comparison of Charles Finney and also Billy Graham. Charles Finney didn't have microphones. Charles Finney didn't have all of the technology we have today. And yet he's recognized as a great evangelist. And he says, well, the survey was this. They checked to see how many of per the percentage of people that were saved after five years. And they found out that all of the millions of people that Billy Graham ministered to that came to the Lord, and I'm saying this, I thank God for his obedience. But after five years in the research that they did, they found out there was only a 5% retention. Now you stop and think 5% of maybe 20, 30, 40 million people, that's a large amount. And praise God, yes. But then the survey said we did a survey of Charles Finney, and we found out that when Charles Finney, not having the technology and all those resources, had an 85% retention. Hmm. So the rhetorical question is why, why, why the difference? And it said that what Charles Swinney would do, and I'm coming down off the platform, Jackie. She tries to keep, keep me, you know, lined up. And when she sees me, the first thing she asks is, Brother Frank, how many cups of coffee did you have today? And I assured her, only one cup today. And so what happens is Charles Finney, the fact is that what it would happen is when he would give a sermon and give an invitation, he'd line chairs up in the front for people that accepted Christ. And he would say they call them the tarrying chairs. In other words, the people sat there until he decided that it was the appropriate time and that was led by the Holy Spirit. And what happened is he knew them that they were saved because they were for really saved. Come on. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about Charles Finney. Charles Finney was a crusty old guy that he was really, people made fun of him just by his appearance. I think I probably could fit into that category too. Listen, don't laugh. I mean, I'm not the only guy in the boat. You understand that? But the fact is that what Charles Finney did, one day he went to New York City, Pastor, and he went, and he went to a, 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 one of these places that they, they did garment, the garment district. And it was an eight-story building, and he comes walking into the lobby, and the girl that was the receptionist looked at him, and she started laughing at him because of how he looked. Hmm. And all she, all this Charles Finney did, all he did was just turn and he looked at her and he turned around and he went this way here. The Holy Spirit so convicted that woman that she began to cry out. She says, God, I mocked one of your servants. She dropped to her knees and began to ask Christ into her life. Before Charles Finney got to the elevator, word of what took place to her took place, and a revival hit that entire building. They say that 80% of the people got saved before he even got to the eighth floor. I'm saying this because, you see, you can't give what you ain't got. And he had, he knew it. I'm not saying Billy Graham didn't, but we're talking about two completely different eras. I'm simply saying that these altars, when we say they give the invitation, the fact is this here, brothers and sisters, you gave your heart to the Lord, now is the time to stand up and shine. Amen. 
If you're embarrassed for Christ and you're afraid to come up, guess what? He's afraid of you or embarrassed of you before the Father. Come on. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying that church, we talk about rebuilding the altar. Uh, we need to get back to the basics of a lot of things that we've gotten away from. Amen? Amen. People coming forward to the altar on the what? Anointed preaching. Uh, you see, that's what we get here. We're getting anointed preaching. Okay, it says, uh, let me see. Did I skip a page? I'm lost. Yeah, okay. People coming forward to the altar under anointed preaching and the working of the Holy Spirit leads to what? Definite conversions. Huh. Let me go on. As the Holy Spirit wondrously produces the new birth in the hearts of the lost. See, the thing is this, all of my flowery words or the puns and all of that, they're nothing. It's not, my words are not what convicts a person of sin. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Understand that. We also see that the altar is also a place for where the prodigal sons and daughters to come back to Christ. You know, we sang about the blessing up there. I want to say this. If you have an unsaved loved one, stop begging God for their salvation. You say, well, what are you talking about, Brother Frank? I said, I want you to understand something. That, that scripture verse that we saw, that th those generations, we're talking about a confession that David, King David made. He said, unto the thousandth generation, understand something, my son and my daughters, they have left our home. But the fact still remains, I don't know what they do, what they don't do. The fact is I raised them up in the way of the Lord. But the assurance that God gave me is that my children are saved. I may not see it. I may not understand it. I may not agree with things that they do. But the one thing that I know is that God's word is infallible. He said, I'm going to bless you. You and your household are saved. So when we pray, Stop begging for this salvation. Begin to come into alignment with the word. Father, I thank you that they're saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, sanctified, and on their way to heaven, and they're going to fulfill the destiny you got on their lives. Come into agreement with the word. Stop looking in the sense realm because God is not operating in the sense realm. He's already working behind the scenes. Guess what? He's already looking from eternity. He's already looking at paternity past, and he's already seeing your sons and your daughters are serving God. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Come on, give the Lord a praise if you have an unsaved loved one and start coming into agreement with the word. There is nothing sweeter than to see a prodigal son or a daughter weeping their way back to God at the altar. Truly, the altar is a place of surrender. I'm going to tell a, a little story. My first church I pastored was Italian Pentecostal church. Yeah, I pastored a bilingual church. Now, a lot of people say, do you speak eloquent Italian? I say, no, I don't speak Italian at all. So how, you know, I said, you don't understand. I am Sicilian. A Sicilians are called outcasts of the main Italy. And if that's the case, I don't speak Italian. I speak Sicilian. But I want you to understand something. God has got a place for Sicilians too. So I, I went the first, amen, brother. So I went to this church, the first church I was pastoring. And there was an elderly Italian woman. Her name is Sister Scardino. Good Irish name. And she said to me, Pastor? Yes. Pastor Bile? Yes. She said, my son Vinny is going out with that girl. And he, she said, I want you to talk to him to not to go with her anymore. I said, Sister, I just got here. Today's my first Sunday. I don't even know the dude. So I said, do you mind if I pray about it? Oh, yeah, pray about it. But make sure you tell him that he needs to stop. I said, what seems to be the problem? Well, she's Catholic. 
Now, you got to understand, we Italian Pentecostals, when we left Catholicism, we left everything that's Catholicism, okay? And they become where you're, you know, like this. So I said to her, well, let me pray about it. So I said, she said, okay. And so, Pastor, what we did was, uh, one night, we'll, the women were going to have their women's meeting. It was going to be Fran's first meeting as the pastor's wife with these women. So I got a hold of Vinny. I said, hey, Vinny, I'm going to be taking my wife to the ladies' meeting. He said, she said, I said, do you mind if maybe you and Kathy can get together with me? We'll go out and have some pizza. There's nothing like solving problems over good pizza. I'll tell you right now. This was four seasons, and they had it divided with four different toppings. Anyway, and so we're sitting in this place. They took us in the back room, and I didn't realize, you know, it was the first time I'd been there. And so what ends up happening is the, the, I start speaking to them. We start eating. And there's a man in the other corner is looking at us. And let me put it like this. I got excellent peripheral vision. And I'm looking at this guy while I'm talking to Vinny and Kathy. And I'm feeling very uncomfortable with this dude. Now, understand this. This was in Hollywood, Florida. Not in Pinellas. Not here in Mount Manatee. I mean, we're talking about places where I felt uncomfortable. So I'm talking with them, and I said, Kathy, I said, let me ask you something. You're a good Catholic girl, aren't you? He, she said, well, yeah. She, I said, I hear that you go, take, go to Mass with your family on Sunday mornings. So she says, yeah, we go to the 730 Mass. I said, Kathy, I really commend you. Now, you're saying you're a Pentecostal preacher, and you're saying that. I said, you know, you're a, you're, you really are a good Catholic girl. I said, but let me ask you something. You, as a good Catholic girl, um, I got a couple of questions to ask you, if you don't mind. She said, sure. I said, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Now, that can be an insulting question. It really can, because that's the core of what they believe. She said, of course I do. I said, do you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? Notice, I didn't say Mary. I was not going to be given Mary equal time with Jesus, okay? You see, you got to be wise as a serpent, gentle as dove. I said to her, I said, Kathy, I said, let me ask you something. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross? They still have him nailed to the cross. So I, she said, yes, I do. I said, do you believe that Jesus was buried and he rose again on the third day? Yeah. And I, I said, Kathy, you know, it's something, I, it's incredible. And you believe that Jesus is coming back for his church? She said, yeah. I said, Kathy, I'm confused. She said, what are you confused about? I said, you believe the same things I do. I said, but let me ask you this. I did something when I was 16 years old. I'm just kind of curious if you did the same thing. She said, what's that? I asked Jesus to become the Lord of my life. I said, have you ever done that? She says, no. I said, let's take care of it right now. And we right there with the pizza. I led it to the Lord. Hey, see? There's, a, there's, there's a, a moral to this because Sister Scardino wouldn't want Kathy to go out with Vinny because she's Catholic, and by her definition, that is being unequally yoked with an unbeliever. So God is beginning to remove all of this. So I prayed with her and everything like that and with Vinny. Just about that time, this guy over the left-hand corner gets up and comes over, and he says to me, he says, thank you. What are you talking about? I said, thank you. I said, for what? He says, thank you for taking time to minister to this young girl. He says, I heard you from over there, and I want you to understand something. What you did this tonight has actually impacted my life. My wife and I have been looking for a church to go to. What church do you go to? And I told him I pastored this particular church. He says, we'll be there Sunday morning. They came. Now, now, that's not the rest of the story. Sunday morning, I know that Kathy gave her heart to the Lord. I didn't say anything to Sister Scardino. Sunday morning comes around. I preach a sermon. And for the life of me, I cannot remember what the message was. But it must have been a whale of a good message. I gave an invitation like we're talking about right now. I gave an invitation. If there's anybody here that wants to dedicate their lives to Jesus, I didn't get the words out of my mouth. Up gets Kathy, jumps up out of the pew, comes running to the altar, and you always know when a woman gives her heart to the Lord when the mascara comes down to her chin. 
And I'm looking at that. I go, uh-oh, Sister Scardino sitting in the back at the end of the service. And she, she, once again, she repeated the sinner's prayer. She had already done it, but she prayed again. And so did the others. We had about 10 people gave their hearts to the Lord that day. We uh, the spirit to the Lord. We give you the Lord thanks. And here's the thing. After the service, I went over to Sister Scardino. I said, you told me that you wanted me to tell Vinny not to go out with that girl because she is not equally yoked because of the scripture. I said, guess what? He's prepared a daughter-in-law for you. We left that church a number of years later, and Sister Scardino had four children, two boys, two girls. The oldest one was Peter. Vinny was the youngest. Two daughters, Antoinette and Leela. Leela was the wild one. But what ended up happening is I was able to get Peter to come back to the Lord. He started serving the Lord. And my wife and I, we got transferred. We moved up to Pennsylvania. And while we were up there, I got word that Peter had been killed in a head-on accident. Antoinette, who had been previously healed from leukemia, after 15 years, Pastor, came down with leukemia again. And within three months, Peter died and Antoinette died. And nor, nor, nor in this time, Kathy, the one who was supposedly the one that was not equally yoked, was the only one that was there for Sister Scardino to carry her through all of this time that she went through. Please, don't try to outguess God. Because, you see, God will use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He'll even get our tradition and our belief system and turn it upside down. He says, I've got a master plan. Leela, the one that was the wild one, she came to the Lord. I'm saying this, that the fact is that when we come to that place of surrender, we're going to see supernatural things take place. Remember the, uh, the board that with all those pictures, every time you see it, don't pray for their salvation or their healing. Start walking and put your hands on your Father. I thank you that they're healed. I thank you that your word has already gone forth. I thank you for their salvations. I thank you for this deliverance. For, we need to start praying the prayer of thanksgiving. The fourth altar is the altar of prayer, okay? The Spirit is calling us to pray. We're seeing that here in the church, and we're beginning to see the results. We're seeing the results, people getting healed, people getting delivered, people getting saved. And, you know, I like what Jesus said when he was confronted by the Pharisees. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be healing them. This is, uh, you know, it, that. And he turned around to them, and he says, which is harder to do, to say to this person, pick up your bed and walk, or your sins be forgiven? You see, Jesus brought it back to the lowest com common denominator. Healing and salvation, both of them are miracles. Come on. Both of them are miracles. Guess what? We operate in the miraculous. Your brain may not tell you that. But God said, I have called you to be an extension of how I operate and greater things than these that you've seen, greater work shall you do. Pastor, I was in a church a number of years ago and there was an elderly couple, I love them, and uh, they were sitting in front of me. And what ended up happening is the Holy Spirit began to move in this church. And this elderly woman, uh, her husband's name was Sherman, I forget what her, her name was, Agnes or something like that. And they were sitting there and all of a sudden people began, periodically began to speak in tongues like we've witnessed people coming up with prophetic words. And while we were there, this one man, Sherman, we were worshiping like what we did tonight, and all of a sudden, the 70, I think 78 or 80-year-old man, he began to speak in tongues. Wow. That had been the first time in five years I'd ever seen this man do that. His wife turns around and smacks him on the side of the head and said, what are you doing? That's not for you. I want you to know something. Three months later, we had her funeral. I want you to understand something. 
God is doing something supernatural. Second Chronicles, and we've heard this many, many times. May we apply it in our altars, both in our churches and in our private lives. What is it? If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, what then will I hear from heaven? I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. I want you to understand something. God is still in the miracle performing business. Okay. He, uh, we must build an altar today in our hearts. It is an altar of surrender. And I like what the, uh, the, the brother that was here on Friday, he said, the fact is that the altar is a place where we get altered. Understand that. We have to build altars, and we need to respect the idea of altars. And by the way, I am not saying that this is the only place where God operates. Your home is an altar. Come on, you could be in your car traveling from here to Douglasville, Georgia, and your car becomes your altar. You could be driving from here to Orlando. That becomes the place of your altar. Number five, the altar is a place to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hmm. I, I, I laugh, my, my sister and my brother-in-law went to a Bible school up in Rhode Island called Zion Bible Institute. And some people may have, you may have heard of that, East Providence, Rhode Island. And there was this one, one beautiful girl, she had a, a voice like an angel, and she played the piano and everything like that. And uh, she was from California. And her father was the pastor of a sizable Assembly of God church. So she came to the school there, and the Holy Spirit began to operate. My wife and I went up there one weekend, and lo and behold, when we went up there, we went there midweek, there was no classes going on. So I started asking, what's going on? Well, in chapel service, the Holy Spirit showed up. We had to shut down classes. This went on for three weeks. So I said, well, you know, I had to, that's awesome. I mean, I was walking on the grounds. I can meet, I, I mean, uh, I love my spiritual father. He said, we had the chill bumps going up and down, goosebumps for a uh, And he said, we ha I'm telling you, the power of God was awesome. But understand this, this one girl from California, she went to the chapel. By the way, they, they had the tabernacle like what we have here. And she went on the corner over there and she said, Lord, you know I haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but I don't want to receive the baptism like all of those others. He said, she said, if you want to baptize me, I said, she said, I do my hair, and I don't want anything to be messed up. I don't want my clothes wrinkled. I mean, she flat out put a grocery list on how she wanted the Holy Spirit to baptize her. I got news for you. That's the kind of language that God don't hear. I keep on telling people, there's only one thing that God doesn't hear and doesn't listen and doesn't abide by. And they say, what's that? He doesn't abide or listen to stupid. Come on. And so she went in there every day. She would stay there for hours. And then all of a sudden, one day, they were playing. I don't know what music it was, but it was worship service. And all of a sudden, she started getting giddy, and she started getting happy, and everything like that. And the people in the church came in, and they were listening because there was a loud voice that was going on. And lo and behold, in the sanctuary, the Lord had this girl rolling on the floor from one end to the other to this way here. Her hair was all messed up. Her dresses was all wrinkled up. God God says, honey, I'm going to show you that I've called you by name and I've got an anointing I'm putting on your life regardless of how you want it. I'm in charge. We getting anything tonight? Praise the name of the Lord. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. As we come to the feet of Jesus, he will pour out his baptism of the Holy Spirit upon a hungry people. I'm going to say this. Don't, uh, last Wednesday night, Pastor, 90% of you had already gone home. And a little boy comes over to me. And he comes over here, right here. And he says, can I pray for you? Now, pride would say, boy, get away from me. 
But I said, son, I said, I'd be honored. Now he hemmed and he hawed and he stuttered, stuttered and everything like that. But the fact remains, I put my hand upon him. I put it on his shoulders. He's praying for me, stuttering his words. I said, Father, right now, I ask you to pour out a special anointing upon this young man and let him begin to see the destiny that you've placed on his life. And the Bible says in the last days, he's going to pour out his spirit upon our sons and our daughters. Now prophesy. I'm going to tell you, every time you see a teenager, every time you see a young one, begin to thank the Lord, Father. They're going to start speaking in tongues. They're going to begin to prophesy. Come into agreement with the word of God, and you'll see that your life will never, ever be the same. Don't limit God. Don't put him in a box. He says, I'm ready to upset your apple cart. He will, pour, he will pour water upon the thirsty. Truly, there is an urgent need for people to be baptized in the Spirit, to receive power to witness, to receive anointing for victorious Christian living. Lord, pour out your Spirit at our altars and in our hearts in fresh power in Jesus' name. That should be our prayer. The sixth one is a place of healing. As people come forward to receive prayer for healing, healing gifts of the Spirit can be given to those who are in need. Hmm. Look at your hands right now. Come on, look at your hands. I want you to speak to those hands. Hands. You will lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Not because of who I am, but because God said it, and that settles it. There's healing in your hands. You see, we get this book of Corinthians, and we get this all mixed up, and we look at all of the gifts, and yet the Bible says in God, Jesus, these were the last words that he said. He said, in my name you will cast out demons. If you drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt you. If a serpent comes out of the fire and blanches onto your wrist, shake it off. Because you are, right now within you, it's flowing the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Elders of the church can anoint with oil following uh, James 5, 14 and 16. And uh, the prayer of faith will result in healing of the sick. It's amazing. They want the pastors to come running. And meanwhile, God has said, Pastor, you need to look at the elders of the church. It's not that the pastors won't. But God has already placed individuals that he said that when they come and they anoint you with oil, your faith is going to be taken care of. And if there, and I like this one here. And it says, and if there be any sin, any sin it shall be forgiven you. Yes. Now, it's not the elders that are forgiving you to sin. It's the prayer of faith that is going to do it. My brothers and sisters, we are supposedly people of faith. Let's start standing on God's word. God also sovereignly touches and heals people to demonstrate his compassion and glory. I got to move right along. Are we seeking and asking for gifts of healing today? We should, but not necessarily that. Mark 16 already gives us that provision. The next one is the altar is a place of worship. The atmosphere of worship invites the presence of the Holy Spirit to touch people's hearts. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. This is in Psalms, that's David speaking. In our individual lives or in corporate worship, understand this, you should not come to church to be pumped up. I'm going to say that again. I didn't get any amens here. I must have been a couple of ouches out there. <laughs> Understand this. You don't come to church to get pumped up to worship. The reason for it is because God created you as a worshiper. Worship is not what we, uh, what we do. Worship is who we are. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise is going to be continuously in my mouth. If I don't praise him, the very stones are going to shout out. We don't need to be pumped up. We need to come to minister. When you come to church on a Sunday morning and they're here and they're ministering, you ought to be praising louder than they're playing. 
because something is going to happen. Because if praise gets into you, it becomes contagious. And God said, I inhabit the praises of my people. Yeah. The requirements for repairing, repairing the altar. Those aspects that once marked the people of God as the holy bride of Christ will need to be cultivated in this day. Two, we must again accept the Bible as authoritative and accurate. Let's stop, stop going to people getting their opinion of Scripture. Third, Christians will be required to affirm their salvation in, is God's gift, offered freely without merit on the part of any mere mortal. I want you to understand some. Salvation is a free gift of God. As a matter of fact, it's coupled together with grace, which is unmerited favor. Come on. We will find that we must insist that salvation is revealed through a godly life. It is a possession and not a profession that must be sought. It, is, it will be necessary that churches must insist, listen to this, must insist that the saved must seek out a congregation where they can faithfully participate in services. We're not looking for spectators. Come on. We're not looking for those that are going to ride the bench. We want people that are in baseball. We want people that are going to be prepared to come in to butt, to, to come in and to, to pinch hit for someone that is on the, on the line. I want you to understand something. God is not looking for spectators. No, no. Because spectators are wimps. I'm serious. You say, that's offensive. If it's offensive, take it up with the author. Discipline among the churches will again be required if we will honor the living God. I want you to understand some. Do not get offended if somebody in leadership says, listen, that is not consistent on how things are done by the word. And if you can't, then you need to take it up with the one that initiated that authority. And understand this, if you don't agree with it, pray about it. Pray about it. And I'm going to show you, you begin to pray about it, God's going to show you your attitude. Your attitude can very easily hinder you from receiving your miracle. Among families, there will be again be need to insist that fathers must accept responsibility to serve as spiritual leaders for their own families. Come on. These are minimum requirements of the altar of God, which uh, the altar of God will be rebuilt. Very quickly, I need to move on right here. Just bear with me. By the way, all of these notes, in the next couple of weeks, I'll have them in a book, and I'll have them at my book table, okay? First of all, now, this altar, what you want to build to God, must be a very special altar. One, it must be an altar of faith. I'm not going to go into all the others. I'm going to just highlight it. Number two, it's also going to be an altar you build must be an altar of praise. Okay. Let it be an altar of thanksgiving. Build an altar of worship. You say, well, thanksgiving, praise, and aren't they all interactive? They are. But well, you have to understand there are distinct, distinct, distinctions between them. Praise is bragging on who he is. Thanksgiving is giving him thanks for what he has done. But worship, that's going into his presence. What we did tonight before I started speaking and we took that time, we were in his presence. And if you felt uncomfortable, that's because you ain't been there before. Come on, that's not a criticism. Let it be an altar of prayer. We sing that song repeatedly. I'm saying this because where we are today, God is saying is he wants to restore things. Make it an altar of sacrifice. Hmm. There comes a time where you may have to lay down on the altar of sacrifice that which you find dear and precious. You might have to let it lay on that altar and let God kill it so he can resurrect it again. 
If you're in ministry, your ministry may need to be sacrificed so that God can restore it. There are some churches that we, we need to do. People need to sacrifice the church to let God kill the excess and that which has taken up the dross and turn around and let God rebuild it again. See, we are in those last days, my brothers and sisters. Make an altar of dedication and consecration. We talked about that previously. Revival through repairing the altar. Instant answer to him. Now, when we do this and we restore this altar, the first thing that's going to happen, we saw that with Elijah. The immediate thing right after that was that there was an abundance of rain. Secondly, when you repair the altar of God and build a new one, then your offerings shall be accepted of the Lord. Hmm. I, can't, I can't build my altar. I have to rebuild his altar. When you have repaired the altar, when you have repaired the altar of the Lord and built a new one, then your potential shall be activated. Hmm. Too many of us are trying to do our own thing and putting God's name to it. When you do that, you'll never get God's results. When you do God, God's way and you join in with it, then you'll always get God's results. When you repair the altar of the Lord and build a new one, you can expect the following instant answer to prayer. When you have repair the altar of God and built a new one then your offering shall be accepted I believe I've covered these already results this is it in closing result of a rebuilt altar Pastor John thank you God is calling people everywhere back to his altar the altar must first be established in our hearts as a place of prayer surrender then it must be strengthened and established wherever God's people gather. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the altar will be established once again as a place of evangelism, surrender, healing, and prayer. It will be a place where people are baptized anew in the Spirit and a place of fresh consecration. And it will be a place of glorious worship. Lord, establish your altar once again. Begin with me. Father, I sense your Holy Spirit is ministering to us this evening. Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is doing that recreative work in our lives. I sense in my spirit that there are those that are hungering and thirsting after righteousness. They're hungering for a fresh outpouring of your spirit. Father, Pastor Phil is going to be talking about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. But I perceive here tonight we have those that have already been filled. And Father, at times they feel as though they've been drained. Father, right now, I just pray that you overshadow each one with your Holy Spirit. Overshadow them to overflow. Father, I sense in my spirit that you're doing a recreative work in each of their lives. I just sense the Holy Spirit is speaking to us right now. As Pastor Phil would say, I want you to take a deep breath. I'm going to count to three. I want everybody to stand up and lift your hands. Praise his holy name. Every one of you that can stand, please stand. When I count to three, I want you to take a deep breath and then let it out. Why you say, why are you doing that? Because it's going to be an act of faith, allowing the Holy Spirit just to fill every cavity in your body. I believe the Holy Spirit is recreating right now, doing something special. We're rebuilding the altar. Thank you. We're rebuilding the altar. Why? Because we want to see that outpouring of His Holy Spirit like Thank never you. before. Yes. Yeah. But you see, we just can't allow it just for the children to do it and the teenager. But the Bible says, if you ask, you shall receive. If you knock, it shall be opened. 
I want you to understand something. God is about to do something here special tonight. Do you believe that? Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, when I count to three, I ask you, Holy Spirit, right now to bathe your people with a fresh anointing. When I count to three, one, two, three, take your breath. Pastor John, lead out with that song, please. Praise God. Welcome in this place, Holy 